Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't come to Vienna, Vienna has to come to you. And thank you. And it does it in the form of one of the rarest species on Earth, probably, an Austrian economist who is actually from Austria. <laughs> uh, my task today is to try to bring back to life a little bit this old Vienna. It's long gone, uh, but of course, as a modern European, there's not much I can do without American support. So it's firstly, <laughs> it's the digital tools made in the US that allow me to show you Karl Menger potentially in a way that you haven't seen him before, trying to bring him back to life a little bit based on a quite rare photography of old Menger. But secondly, more importantly, it's of course thanks to American Austrians that the Austrian school has survived to be something living to this day, and so that I could rediscover it and, and, and try to get interested in, in its history. Uh, now let's go back to a world long gone, uh, seemingly very different from ours, but bearing some striking resemblances to our modern predicaments. Uh, let's go back to, to Karl uh, uh, Menger and his life trajectory. Um, his uh, uh, way of spiraling into old Vienna. And uh, we see here it's quite a different world that he, that he was moving in, uh, quite representative for a civic elite uh, of uh, newly emerging in this time. He was polyglot, he was mobile, cosmopolitan, quite flexible. And uh, well, unfortunately, the rest of the population didn't really follow suit, these elites. Uh, so, uh, Novi, uh, Neu Sandes, where he was born, nowadays is Novi Sad in Poland. Uh, Teschen and Tropa, where he went to school. Anna Opava and Chijin in the Czech Republic. Lemberg, where he worked as a journalist, and Ludwig von Mises was born, is now Lviv in the Ukraine. Uh, and, uh, Interestingly, Maniovi, the place where he spent his childhood, uh, more or less was raised uh, on the estates of his grandparents, physically disappeared. Uh, it was submerged uh, by an artificial lake uh, and doesn't exist anymore. Now, in the other places, at least, the buildings survive, but the spirit uh, is long gone. Uh, and uh, it was a very interesting time of a crumbling empire, which in its last decades had somehow arrived its peak uh, and uh, shot a lot of tensions and contradictions. Now, by moving across this empire, he shifted through different contradicting identities uh, more and more in the tension of a centralized empire. And uh, the Austrian empire was falling behind the other more modern states in Europe, the British, the French, the Prussians. But there was another empire that had fallen behind the Austrians before it was the Ottoman Empire. So the Austrian Empire uh, had somehow to encompass parts of the falling Ottoman Empire in its structure in uh, southeastern Europe. And you see this dispersal of ethnicities here. That's a map showing uh, all the dispersed ethnicities, uh, a dozen languages, half a dozen religions, one of them Islam. Uh, trying to cope uh, with keeping track of modernity. And uh, what is that uh, modernity? It's, uh, it was mentioned before, the more decentralized market structure of the West uh, led to a wealth miracle, which then led to military dominance uh, through more innovation, more technology, more capital to spend. That's the train structure in old Austria-Hungaria mostly financed via private means, private capital financed this quite important technology of bringing people together, but of course also very important military technology of moving troops quickly. Um, and at the same time, we had capital investments in printing presses, and of course the printing press was fairly old, but what was no new and, and quite recent, very dynamic, was the spread of mass printing, reaching the masses, connecting the minds in a dynamic that's very similar to the modern internet and, and what it has done by bypassing elites as well uh, and, and spreading, uh, spreading new ideas 
all around these quite obsolete structures. Uh, so in the 19th century, Austria-Hungary, by modernizing very late, but more dynamically, more quickly than other places, it even took over transport and mail up to Egypt and the Near East. Uh, uh, Austrian steam-powered ship went uh, until India uh, even, um, and we have this uh, dynamic of wealth creation coming uh, pretty late because the crown realized that it really needed this kind of development. Uh, so that's maybe, you know, uh, Rosling, the empiricist uh, from Sweden, who has shown that uh, uh, we had the same dynamic in the 19th century in large parts of Europe, uh, taking over capitalist wealth uh, creation, as then in the 20th century, large parts of Asia have followed suit. And it's a quite similar dynamic here uh, that we could see, uh, leading to reinvestment and leading to a general reconstruction of the city of Vienna, um, the city of Vienna, we've stood two times with fortifications, the Ottoman onslaught, uh, and then becoming a hub, uh, not only of a centralized empire as the, the capital, but also due to network effects of this interconnectedness becoming a financial hub. Uh, and uh, that was more important for the 19th century. Uh, so the old Vienna outgrew its limitations, the fortifications were raised, and again, it was mostly private capital financing the reconstruction, large-scale reconstructions of large parts of Vienna, taking away not only for the fortifications, but also the Class C, which is the whole area in front of the fortifications to better help defend against the, uh, the riders that, that may emerge on the horizon. So new Modern boulevards were created, uh, uh, one of still most impressive ones in Europe, the Ring uh, Street, uh, going all around the old city, along the fortifications and the Classy, and uh, bringing together all these elite uh, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And uh, among those people were students and administrators and uh, flawed to the universities, uh, German then replaced Latin as the main language uh, of teaching, and uh, it was among this group, unfortunately, mostly lawyers uh, uh, next to doctors, uh, but of course you have an empire, you need lots of lawyers. There we have the Austrian school emerging uh, through uh, Karl Menger, who was studying law uh, as well, um, and economics was part of the legal faculties uh, here. Uh, Karl Menger became a very young professor and he rose to prominence and it was partly due to the crown understanding that they need to understand economics. Uh, they granted absolute economic liberty, unfortunately, only to an elite of big merchants, uh, but those merchants got zero percent tax, zero regulation, and were given the freedom to industrialize Austria-Hungary, and the success rate was quite impressive. Uh, and uh, a lot of the nobility of the Austrian school, the funds are actually new nobility of uh, entrepreneurs, of engineers being part of that very dynamic uh, project uh, of bringing Austria back to the modern time, or to the modern time. Uh, now that's, of course, the principles. Uh, you've seen it before. Uh, first, uh, the Germans belittled the Austrians, but then there was international recognition pretty soon here in 1888. It's the first mention of Austrian uh, economists uh, uh, in the College Journal of Economics. And then in 89, in the Wiener Zeitung, was shown. Also, there's the first time there's this talk of an Austrian school, Österreichische Schule von Volkswirten, Austrian School of Economists. So it was pretty quick recognition of a school and it was mainly thanks to Karl Menger, uh, who rose to this prominence because he was also the tutor of the crown prince, uh, who would have become a reformer. Um, and uh, Karl Menger invested most of his time and effort into bringing about a generation uh, of young people who made splendid careers in the monarchy uh, and he was for a while hopeful that it could be reformed and brought up to date. Here is uh, the, the lecture directory of the University of Vienna and it's mostly students of Karl Menger teaching uh, there in the early 20th century uh, as part still of the uh, legal faculty teaching Austrian economics uh, and uh, 
His student, Böhm von Barwerk, even became Minister of Finance. He is the president of the Academy of Sciences. Uh, in front, you see old Karl Menge sitting. Uh, so it's, it's quite a lot of prominence for a school. Um, and it looks like an amazing success story, even having here the Minister of Finance uh, on our old Hunda Schilling banknote uh, memorized. Unfortunately, there's a dark side to that success story. And uh, as only the Crown Prince committed suicide, uh, he went mental, uh, as lots of people did at the time. All this new interconnectedness, uh, I mean, here you see Karl Menge upon his death. It was on the main page of one of the main newspapers. So a really prominent person. But the time had changed, of course, in 1929 already, and he had become very pessimistic. Uh, unfortunately, he was prophetic, uh, as it turned out to be. Most people were overwhelmed by the new uncertainties, and they sought new false certainties to be imposed on other people. Uh, and it was an epidemic of neurosis in Vienna. So as you say, I think in America, people went batshit crazy. <laughs> and there's a one, one symptom of that, there's only one Austrian school of economics, but there are at least three Austrian schools of psychology. So <laughs> there's quite some coping <laughs> uh, with that. Uh, and I think it shows some striking similarity. Of course, among those people going mental, some unfortunately very important political thinkers uh, are young, Stalin, Trotsky, Hitler, Tito, all met in similar coffee shops right next to each other in this old Vienna. So that's sad. <laughs> how the best of times sometimes bring forth the worst of people. Uh, and the general challenge behind it was uh, a wrong approach to modernity, which we've seen also in the more developed nations like France and, and, and Prussia. Um, and it's this kind of top-down enlightenment where the educated people, they think they are of a better cloth and they try to take over the power in society from the full order, and they try to impose a kind of modernization on the population. And they think they know it all because they're educated, they went to university, they got their PhD, now they know it all, they just have to implement it, uh, but of course have no practical experience whatsoever. And unfortunately, it's this kind of top-down approach that's how the Austrian Enlightenment, it's usually perceived, it already started quite early, with Joseph II or his mother, Maria Theresa, who under the pressure of falling behind the more modernized nations, tried to copy some of the top-down modernization. And of course, it was reflected again in the centralized bureaucracy that tried uh, to co-op uh, uh, thinkers like Karl Meng and bring in uh, people like Böhm von Barwerk in their centralized bureaucracies. Uh, um, is this Joseph? Uh, the second who nationalized monasteries as well. And, and uh, he didn't prevail. There was quite a counter reaction, of course, to this top down modernization. Most of the country was still very urban, um, uh, agrarian. Um, so uh, it was then belated that this new tribe of social engineers emerged in the modernized uh, universities with modern sciences and, and feeling like they really understand it now and are ready to impose that order. And it's out of that uh, uh, hybrids, this kind of pride of intellectuals that a large part of the craziness emerged and uh, uh, the Austrian cult was submerged by a kind of death cult. Uh, and uh, it's the Austrian schools of psychology that came up with the term of the Thanatos, the death drive. And I think it's quite telling uh, that actually what seems like a top-down enlightenment actually is disrespect for the complexity and uncertainty of life, and it's an imposition of order, and it's a kind of death try. It's you want to kill what you don't understand so you can control it, so you can um, uh, impose a certain order led by technocrats, led by experts. Uh, and in old Vienna, we had this struggle between the death try and uh, the drive of life, and it was reflected as well, not only in economics, but in arts and literature. And it's quite interesting that this realism of the Austrian school you can also find in the other Austrian schools of other sciences, uh, and you can find it in arts and literature 
as well. Um, so you see there's quite a struggle going on uh, within the soul of modern human beings. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Friedrich August von Hayek uh, put it quite aptly when he said, we are also in a fight for the party of the living. So he took the term, it reflects a bit the thinking of Ayn Rand as well, that you also have to, have to take a stand for the living, the living that you can't really grasp and understand immediately. And it's reflected in aesthetic struggle or aesthetic challenge as well between the death drive of people imposing a new order, which usually is an ugly order, and people trying to cope and figure out how beauty and truth can be brought in an, back in an uncertain age of modernity. And we had that struggle in architecture as well in old Vienna. And on the one hand, we have Otto Wagner, who tried something quite similar to Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, using modern forms to try to find a fusion between utility and beauty. Um, and of course, the youth style of this 19th century Vienna is quite related to the Art Deco styles uh, in other places. It's trying to, it's trying this, this uh, uh, quite challenging uh, struggle. He erred a bit on the side of top-down enlightenment again, which is also the time of the planned city, and that was his uh, plan for a large part of Vienna, which wasn't put into practice, fortunately. I have to say, because you can already see quite of this top-down imposition of order, um, which wouldn't have worked out that well. So I think the Ringstrasse is more of a compromise, uh, maybe not a perfect one. There was a counter-reaction to the top-down imposition, and it was another architect, a little less known, Camilo Sitte. He thought that beauty lies in the bottom-up spontaneous order of medieval cities, and uh, he really cherished the old marketplaces as compared to the new boulevards uh, that are created on planned order. But he erred a bit on the side of nostalgia and romanticism, and of course failed to see a little bit the reality of the squalor and the darkness that some of the modernizers, of course, tried to fight by making use of capitalist wealth creation, of bringing electricity, sanitation to the people. Um, um, and again, it was mostly private developers uh, building and um, creating this new standard of living in old, new uh, Vienna at the time. Uh, so this struggle, I think, is quite important to understand the true legacy of the Austrian school, because the similarities with other schools are quite striking of the same time, and I think it's a different kind of enlightenment. Uh, it's a quite different project of an enlightenment. It's not at all like the French enlightenment of the philosoph, uh, like these intellectuals imposing an order. It's more like the Scottish enlightenment uh, of people from theory and practice coming together and struggling with uh, modernity and figuring out that uh, being enlightened doesn't mean that you see everything from up top and you know everything. It's understanding that our reason is but a small candle and uh, it combines two very contradicting approaches and one is the humility, being humble in trying to know, being humble in understanding that you will not be able to control the true uncertainty and complexity of life but you can be humbled by trying to understand a little bit about it. But at the same time, understanding by appreciating that there is some darkness and quite a lot of darkness, not only the darkness of uncertainty and complexity, but also another kind of darkness, the death drive that I mentioned. And it takes a very different stance, a different approach. It takes a principled approach, an even belligerent approach of fighting this kind of darkness. And that's what people still, uh, what gets people still confused about someone like Ludwig von Mises, who combined this humility in his strive for knowledge with the absolute steadfastness and even belligerence in his fight for principles against the darkness that he perceived in not giving in and proceeding ever more boldly against that kind of darkness that is all pervasive uh, in the philosophical, scientific, and literal, literary tradition of all Austria in, in being aware that there's a kind of darkness challenging us. And uh, it's bringing this world together so that also two of the lesser known students of uh, uh, Karl Menger, um, 
helping make an outstanding impact on the world. Uh, those are Felix Somari and Richard Schiller. Um, they were actually his favorite students. And because they were his favorite students, he recommended to them, don't become academics. <laughs> <laughs> and they were gloomy as well, but in a realistic, positive sense. They were as prophetic as their teacher. Uh, Felix Omari would be known as the Raven of Zurich because being so prophetic, with, at, which at the time seemed very pessimistic and gloomy, so he went to Switzerland and he became instrumental in creating private banking in Switzerland and an underestimated infrastructure of trade in the dark times of uh, wars uh, in Europe. And Richard Schiller led a life as a hidden diplomat behind the, certain, behind the curtains, working really hard to bring back peace after the Second World War and was instrumental in bringing back a small independent Austria not being submerged in a larger structure. Uh, so that's quite interesting that very early on you have very practical people being influenced by the Austrian school, not being that well known, but having an outsized impact and being part of a larger project here that's at the same time humble, but very steadfast in fighting the darkness of our times. And of course, part of the mood was already not in the bureaucracy, in the castles, uh, in the offices, it was in the salon and coffee shop culture of old Vienna, where not only the craziest people and the fools met, but also some of the greatest minds of their time met. Uh, and that's why I, what I perceive as the peak and pinnacle of this old Austrian school. And uh, uh, it was in particular one person who was crucial for that pinnacle of the Austrian school, and that was Ludwig von Mises. Um, he was working for the Chamber of Commerce at the time, uh, I mean, you have to make some money uh, as an academic. But uh, here he instituted his Mises Circle, um, and uh, those are the still remaining halls uh, in the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, uh, we rediscovered only a decade ago a plaque that was installed there by four people. Unfortunately, only one person is left to be with us uh, today. Um, was a plaque installed in 1988 to commemorate uh, the Mises Circle at the place of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it's somehow the Austrian functionaries then now living off the entrepreneurs that they are milking at the <laughs> modern Chamber of Commerce, forgot all about this tradition and, and forget about the plaque and it somehow got lost someplace. Fortunately, we were able to rediscover it and now it has got its place back. Uh, that plaque, I now you can read. The names was put up by Marit von Mises, Marie Rothbard, uh, Burton Plumert, and Lou Rockwell. Uh, and it's still there, a bit scratched, but bears the signatures. Uh, and uh, after this uh, Mises circle, which was quite peculiar, was just, not just a seminar of economics and theoretical economics, it was Ludwig von Mises brought together business people, people from other disciplines, artists, uh, of their time, and it was really like an extended salon. So after uh, their meeting at the Chamber of Commerce, they would move on to a restaurant uh, called the Green Anchor, or the Anchor of Erde, having a fusion kitchen at the time, Italian-Austrian fusion kitchen. Uh, the room still survived. The restaurant, of course, couldn't survive. Uh, all this regime uncertainty uh, we've had, uh, and I think even the last restaurant now has shut down to the craziness. Uh, the darkness uh, of modern times. Uh, there was not enough after dinner. They went on to a coffee shop. The Café Künstler was right in, in, in front of the university. I think it's the only picture surviving of that. Um, on sunny days, they could sit, sit outside, but during the night, they went inside, and it's there on the piano that uh, famous songs of the Mises Circle were sung. And it uh, was uh, quite symbolic for this approach of the Austrian Enlightenment, which is sometimes called the gay or cheerful apocalypse. It's you see the darkness and you're very realistic and you appreciate it, but it doesn't let it spoil your mood. You still keep your mood up and you 
maintain your strength, your mental strength, uh, and uh, uh, your strength in dark times. And that's made it possible for this tradition to survive uh, until our days, so that uh, even a Ludwig von Mises uh, can still be with us as if he was still here teaching us uh, through his books. Uh, he was not only an accomplished theoretical economist, but quite a practical person who uh, made an outstanding practical achievement, and that was that in old age, he had to leave his home, and in old age, he had to restart his life in a new language, in a completely different surrounding. And he achieved that feat. Uh, he is one of the bare threads by which this tradition has survived, by writing in English, teaching in English, and bringing this tradition forth to new generations. Uh, and it's also the 40 years of the Mises Institute, so I think are very much a practical achievement of a dissemination. And uh, it's now up to me to thank you from the bottom of my heart that you have given the Austrian school a splendid second home and have made it possible this tradition has survived to this day to see probably the largest generation of Austrian economists and practical people being inspired by the Austrian school that has ever lived on the planet, much larger than the small elite in old Austria. Thank you very much, my dear American Austrians. Thank you.